so next we have Arseni, who's going to present to us about a paper on uh, psychedelics and neuroplasticity. Uh, it's been a while since we had a neuroplasticity paper, so we're all super excited for this. Uh, Arseni is a graduate neuroscience student at the University of Montreal. Uh, his work is focused on synaptic plasticity and Alzheimer's disease, so very relevant here. Uh, still, his interest in psychedelics led to the question of how psychedelics modulate neuroplasticity, and that question will be addressed in this talk. And so with that, Arsani, please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So um, yeah, I'm going to present some um, data on uh, neuroplasticity. Let me see if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, maybe just give a little bit more uh, background because I'm working. So I'm working right now, I'm finishing my master's uh, in neuroscience and I'm, I'm working with neuroplasticity in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so I'm interested in psychedelics and I wanted just to connect a bit. Uh, so there is not only one study, I'm presenting a bit of like the review of what is uh, what is known about the psychedelics effect of neuroplasticity. And uh, as we will see, um, it's, it's pretty, uh, there is some evidence, there is some clear evidence, but there is some evidence that are pretty confusing and uh, um, until, uh, and tangle, so we'll try to untangle that. So first Sorry, of all- Sorry, Anthony, not to interrupt, but did you mean to be on presenter view or I'm not sure if you have the dual screen near thinking oh, that- Oh, yes, 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 yeah, I have it. Okay. Okay. okay, yeah, it's just, it's showing the your your notes and everything, so- Oh, okay, I'm not sure if it should, okay, then I'll-, I'll... Yeah, it's not just the slide, it's the presenter view there. So I'm not sure if you wanted to have it the opposite way. It's okay either way, but just in case okay, you- Okay, no, just, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, Okay, um, so uh, for neuro neuroplasticity, what is neuroplasticity? Um, just to remind people, I'm not sure, so I feel like there's people from different backgrounds. So uh, neuroplasticity in general refers to the capacity of the nervous system to modify itself uh, functionally and structurally in, in response to experience and trauma. Um, so for an example uh, here, I just wanted to give um, a quick example, a quick refresher. So uh, we have the um, uh, neurons communicate through synapses. Synapses are junctions between two neurons. The action potential uh, releases um, uh, certain neurotransmitters that propagate into uh, into the they propagate into the other neurons. So we have depolarization or current in the other neuron, and that's how the neurons communicate. So for neural plasticity, uh, the main premise here is uh, if we have repeated stimulation or some of the molecules can modulate this neural plasticity. So the synapses between those neurons neurons would strengthen or weaken, and when they're strengthened. Uh, we will get um, reinforcement of uh, certain memories. So that's actually here. I wanted to um, um, just to give a, an idea how the memories uh, implicated in neuroplasticity and how neuroplasticity is implicated in memory. So the idea here, as you can see on the right, can, can you see my uh, cursor? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we can see your cursor, but maybe it, if you can blow it up a little bit so it's a little easier to see what you say. Oh. Like this is better. Yeah, perfect. Oh you. yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, okay. Here you see uh, in neuroscience, it's uh, it's called an engram. Uh, basically, uh, in simple words, it's just a network of connected cells, connected cells through the synapses. So when we have an experience, when we uh, see something, for example, our visual cortex activates, and uh, the information propagates through the brain. So if we, for example, think about something and repeat it and try to refer something. Uh, those same connections or similar connections would uh, get the action potentials that would propagate and that would reinforce those synapses, which in turn would create a network, which would create a network which would represent this memory. This representation of memory is called an engram, and that's what uh, how, how uh, in simple words, the memory is formed in the brain. So the neuroplasticity in this case is the fundamental uh, process for forming those memories. So for forms of neural plasticity, there is several forms of neural plasticity. First of all, we have to distinguish neural plasticity and neurogenesis. While neural plasticity is usually um, the change in the structure and uh, function of um, uh, the functional structure changes in our brain, uh, adult neurogenesis is uh, the birth, the actual the the pr production of new neurons. Uh, in there's uh, three regions in the brain that were in even in the adulthood we have the um, we have the adult neurogenesis, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so for uh, regular plasticity, for neural plasticity, we have um, uh, two main types, which is uh, short-term and long-term. 
So for short-term plasticity, it doesn't last too long. It's one minute. So mostly we're going to be talking about long-term plasticity. And that's where the psychedelics were shown to have an effect on the long-term plasticity. So the long-term plasticity in, um, in turn would could be subdivided into Hebian and hemostatic, which uh, means Hebian plasticity is uh, what I just was explaining about the uh, repeating something and trying to memorize some kind of information. So this uh, process would be uh, it would be um, backed up by heaven plasticity. Homeostatic plasticity, on the other hand, would be the, the processes that would uh, counteract the heaven plasticity, not necessarily that would balance it out. Because what happens if we have uh, a memory, the way that, that's what, for example, happens with PTSD. If we have a memory that is uh, reinforced too much, the, uh, the, the, this memory becomes, one can say, too strong. So we have too many receptors on the cell. Um, and the brain is not able to forget, it's, the brain is not able to delete a certain memory. So in this case, there is certain processes um, that is homeostatic plasticity that try to balance this uh, equilibrium between, uh, um, between reinforcement and weakening of the synapses. So for homeostatic plasticity, there is several types. Um, just wanted to mention, so I'm working mostly with the metaplasticity, which is uh, the rules that govern plasticity itself. And uh, for example, there is another one which I'm not going to go into detail in the talk, but uh, endocannabinoid plasticity, where it's um, it's a huge topic right now. Uh, it's shown that uh, CB1 receptors uh, in the brain uh, mediate a certain type of plasticity that has its uh, this name. Uh, but this is a this is a topic for a separate talk. For um, so for the difference between functional and structural plasticity. For structural plasticity, as it uh, as it says already, it's mostly about the changes in the dendrites in the in the physical uh, manifestations of uh, uh, memory formation. So we have dendrites, we have spines, and uh, uh, axons that would um, uh, that would change. For functional, it's it would be mostly for LTP and LTT, which is long term depression and long term potentiation. And uh, here you can see uh, this is a Quick uh, um, reminder. I'm not sure if you, um, if you, you, you saw the, the idea, but this is important because those receptors are going to be implicated in uh, uh, neural plasticity and how uh, psychedelics actually modulate them. So two main receptors. Okay, there is some information here for people who didn't uh, see this information before. So AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. Uh, when the action potential propagates. From the presynaptic terminal, we have the release of uh, neurotransmitter. So for neurotransmitter, in this case, it's mostly glutamate for excitatory neurotransmission. But when we talk about um, when we talk about uh, um, uh, psychedelics, we'll talk a lot about serotonin for sure. So it, it's released. Uh, the the glutamate binds to the AMPA receptor on the postsynaptic uh, side. It um, allows uh, sodium. And uh, it allows the current to go in the cell. It depolarizes the NMDA receptor. So in NMDA receptor is considered the central receptor for uh, process of, of plasticity because it works like as a coincidence receptor. Uh, meaning when there is a depolarization on the postsynaptic side here, and uh, there is, an, there is a, an action potential that going from presynaptic side, this receptor, um, this receptor captures this uh, pre to postsynaptic uh, um, uh, timing and allows to uh, allows calcium to go in and uh, reinforce the synapse. Uh, so here, the, the NMDA receptor. Uh, I'm not going to go in detail how it does it. The idea is that uh, it, uh, it it works like as a coincidence receptor, um, uh, trying to catch this uh, this um, coincidence between the pre and post synaptic uh, um, current. Uh, so here, the last one here. Um, just the idea, there is several pathways involved, so AMPA and MDA. There is another receptor that is very important, which is MQR5. And uh, this receptor actually, we'll see in a second, would be implicated in, uh, in uh, psychedelic, uh, this, this pathway would be implicated in psychedelic, uh, um, psychedelic modulation of uh, neural plasticity. So here for, um, for MQR5, for example, this one is a metabotropic receptor, meaning it doesn't allow ions, it doesn't allow current to go through the cell directly. So there is second messengers that go and they release calcium from intracellular stores. 
and we'll see that calcium is the 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 molecule that would be mediating mostly uh, the processes of neural plasticity. Okay, so th th that was a quick background uh, recap. So uh, just uh, for psychedelics, we're, I'm going to be talking mostly about classical hallucinogens, classical psychedelics, uh, which are here at the bottom. So those classical psychedelics mostly work on 5H2A receptors. And um, Andrian just mentioned the 5H2A receptors, which is uh, right now the, the center of research for uh, psychedelic effect and not just for plasticity. Uh, for the other ones, uh, we, we can see here that, for example, stimulus depressants would have different effects on different, uh, um, different um, neuromodulators. For example, depressants would be mostly GABA and stimulants would be mostly dopamine. Uh, antipsychotics, for example, that, that's interesting. And uh, I found it interesting that they, they are, um, one can say, on the other on the other side of uh, hallucinogens, and uh, those ones, uh, antipsychotics and uh, SSRIs are part of them. Uh, they work on uh, serotonin and dopamine system as well. However, uh, SSRIs work, for example, mostly on 5H1A, so which is a different family of receptors. Um, okay, so with this 5H2A receptor, uh, what is it? Where is it located? 5H2A receptor expressed mostly in uh, the anterior forebrain, so in the cortex, and particularly in default mode network. So this is, uh, maybe you, you've seen the talks, uh, some people talk about a lot about how psychedelics suppress default mode network, but in general, 5H2A receptor were shown to be present a lot in the cortex. Uh, however, there is some subcortical uh, representation for, for 5H2A receptor as well. On the other hand, 5H2A, 5, uh, 5H2A receptor, which is uh, implicated in SSRIs, um, is uh, mostly represented in subcortical regions uh, versus cortical. So we have this uh, uh, double-edged sword, on, one can say. Um, um, so for, for effect, there is a lot of uh, different uh, receptor subtypes. Um, and each serotonin receptor subtype has its own um, final action, fi final function, for example. So for 5H21A receptor, at the end, it's mostly excitatory receptors. So, however, as some of them from indirect pathways, um, one could say that uh, they uh, produce inhibitory effects as well. And that's why it gets a little bit complicated with the uh, types of the receptors, because with eight uh, families of receptors in the brain, um, when uh, the um, SSRIs bind to several of them, it, it, it becomes uh, pretty complicated to distinguish which receptor is responsible for particular uh, brain region activations. Uh, yeah, so for the functions of 5 h 2 receptor, um, the main uh, hypothesis theory that uh, I found uh, very uh, compelling is that serotonin, brain serotonin mediates uh, adaptive responsive to adversity via two distinct mechanisms, which is 5H21A and 5H21A2A. Uh, uh, so for the 2A, which is psychedelic, uh, which the psychedelics bind to, the classical psychedelics bind to, um, those ones was shown to a increased plasticity, of course, um, increased environmental sensitivity, uh, learning and memory, and adaptability and change. So here, the idea that two receptors may a different response to stress, while one is uh, active response to stress, when we go out and we confront the stress, 5H21A receptor is mostly uh, resilience, patience, so tolerance to stress. And uh, we shouldn't underestimate because it depends on the situation when we have to, um, uh, when we have to employ one or the other um, approach to stress. In some situations, uh, we have to go through and tolerate the stress. In some situations, we have to adaptively change and confront the situation. So, um, for there has been um, some research and a lot of uh, um, sex differences. We'll see that there is a lot of uh, sex differences implicated in the 5 h 2 receptor and psychedelics, how they work in the brain. Uh, but here, I'm going to just give a resume on what levels uh, psychedelics affect neuroplasticity. 
So starting from molecular level, we have molecular changes in signaling pathways, gene transcription protein synthesis. Uh, for this one in particular, when we're talking about uh, long-term uh, memory and uh, long-term uh, uh, long synaptic plasticity, this is what is needed for, we, we, we need gene from transcription and protein synthesis for long-term uh, neural plasticity and for long-term memory. Uh, for the, on the cellular level, we'll have neurogenesis, so proliferation, differentiation, and migration of the cells. And uh, dendritic and synaptic plastic, uh, dendritic and synaptic level, uh, where we will talk about uh, dendritic spines and um, uh, synapses. Um, okay, so for the molecular level, uh, nothing. Okay, just gonna focus on uh, several uh, several parts of the pathway. So here you can see 5H2A receptor. So the psychedelics usually bind to 5H2A receptor. Um, and they initiate the pathway. So this is a G protein coupled receptor, meaning it's not, uh, it doesn't allow ions directly through, but it works through a, um, a second, second messenger pathway. So it's a G, it, it's a G protein coupled receptors that starts a pathway that um, eventually releases calcium from intracellular stores. Here, the point that I was uh, trying to show you is that, for example, the pathway that was here, when we're talking about MGLUR5, and MGLUR5, the receptor uh, is the receptor needed for LTD, long term depression. So, this receptor activation of this receptor leads to um, depression of the synaptic, uh, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the long term depression of the uh, responses of the synapse. Uh, so, long term depression usually is, uh, is a correlate of forgetting. So, when we forget, when we raise memories, this is long term depression. For, uh, simplistically. For long-term potentiation is the opposite. We reinforce the synapses, we try to remember. So this MGLUR5, uh, it's, it's the, same, the same pathway because it's a GQ, it's the same pathway, um, releasing calcium from intracellular stores and eventually through this pathway, re um, reducing a depression at those synapses. So here we see the same thing. So 5H2A receptor uh, should Induce synaptic depression, which is uh, which is interesting, and we'll see if it actually does um, in a couple of slides. The other thing, the other important thing for uh, modulation of psych what psychedelics modulate is BDNF. So BDNF, um, you can see it here, and we'll go here. So BDNF is a brain-derived neurotropic factor. I'm not sure if most of you heard or had an encounter with the, it's a pretty popular molecule right now in science. Um, so BDNF is a protein that supports the growth, survival, and differentiation of uh, uh, mature neurons. There is plenty of other uh, neurotropic factors that are very important in development. BDNF especially is important in the adulthood. So if you inject BDNF in, uh, in a mouse brain, you will have proliferation, mature, uh, you will have uh, growth of the new synapses and new dendritic spines. Um, BDNF also, for example, was shown to uh, uh, be increased after exercise. Exercise increases BDNF, and some other activities uh, could increase BDNF. In this case, uh, psychedelics were shown to increase the level of BDNF, and through this level of BDNF, it was hypothesized that um, it uh, it uh, reinforces reinforces and uh, uh, promotes synaptic plasticity. It specifically. Uh, Okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna go too much into, uh, into uh, molecular pathways. So the expression of BDNF is increased in uh, serum 24 to 48 hours after single administration of psychedelics. Um, and here uh, for acute doses, five, 10 or 20 micrograms were shown to increase BDNF and plasma levels up to six hours. So here, this is a figure for microdosing. So the question of uh, if microdosing works and do we need the, the actual, um, the, the, the psychedelic experience, the, 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 the psychedelic experience to have, um, to have neuroplasticity enhanced. And in fact, what we can see here that for microdosing, for example, for 20 micrograms of LSD, we have increased, a uh, substantial increase in uh, BDNF level um, in, uh, in uh, plasma.
in people. So also BDNF, uh, that's what maybe you've heard before uh, for BDNF as a molecule, the, um, as psychedelics, they, uh, prom they make the brain uh, plastic as in, uh, as in children. So the idea that, uh, that there's critical periods, those critical periods in children and psychedelics produce, uh, psychedelics uh, mimic a little a bit the effect of those critical periods, making our brain plastic as children used to have them, as we used to have them. Um, in fact, here, the, this claim is supported mostly by the idea of BDNF, because BDNF in children, uh, it promotes and uh, regulates this critical periods, opening and closure of critical periods. So the idea that we have BDNF in the adulthood, and we can increase this BDNF and induce uh, some features of critical period in the adult brain, um, this is a fascinating, uh, uh, the f fascinating uh, um, area of research right now. Um, yeah, here just a quick, uh, um, quick figure from the study where they measured the BDNF protein levels for LSD, DMT, and DOI. And you can see it's uh, twice, around twice uh, fold increase um, after the acute administration. So for the neuronal level, okay, so for the neuronal level, I mean, it was already mentioned, psychedelics promotes synaptogenesis, spinogenesis, and functional plasticity. Um, here, the interesting, um, uh, the, 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 there is a caveat, especially for preclinical pre studies, because I'm talking mostly about preclinical studies uh, with mice and other animal models. The problem, um, the, the dosage for those studies is much higher than we would expect for humans. So, uh, for example, 0 0.1 uh, milligram per kilogram is around even a bit more than uh, a, a 200 uh, micrograms of LSD, which is which is a dose that you would have already a, a psychedelic trip, psychedelic experience. So, and in this case, the, this is considered a low dose for um, for um, preclinical studies. Uh, in any case, for low doses or for moderate doses. We can see the increase in synaptogenesis, but for high doses like one milligram per, per kilogram, which is huge, you, the, the, this is a, most likely the person would have a really bad trip in this case. Um, we can see that there is a decrease in proliferation. There is actually decrease in plasticity and other uh, markers of plasticity uh, with the very high doses. Um, okay, I'm gonna just run because there is not that much time left, I think. Um, adult neurogenesis. Uh, I, on the news, it's been on the news a lot, uh, several regions in the brain that still have adult neurogenesis. Uh, here we're talking mostly about hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. Uh, the neurogenesis persists into adulthood. And uh, it's been shown that psychedelics can increase adult neurogenesis in hippocampus. Here, the same idea, the higher doses would actually decrease adult neurogenesis, while moderate to lower doses would have um, a positive effect on uh, adult neurogenesis. Uh, on the other hand, there's uh, some interesting studies about DMT as opposed to LSD, where DMT has been shown to increase neurogenesis and LSD didn't have any effect. Uh, of course, I mean, more studies would be needed for, uh, for uh, to interpret those results. Okay, for uh, dendritic, and this is, uh, um, I think the last part of the talk for, uh, dendritic and synaptic levels of uh, neural plasticity, how it changes uh, for administration of DMT, uh, 10 micromolars and LSD, this is high, this is very high concentrations actually. So uh, we again have the problem with the high concentrations of, um, of those substances. Um, the cortical neurons for resulted in increase in dendrite complexity, spine number and functional plasticity. You can see here for the vehicle, uh, vehicle is, uh, there is nothing. We have no new uh, spines or new synapses. For uh, DOI, DMT, and LSD, for example, LSD very clear. We can see new uh, in 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 the yellow here. We can see new uh, dendrites and new synapses that are spruning uh, out of the axon here. Um, I mean, it's dendrite. Anyway, so um, uh, also it's been shown that in this study, in the study that I was uh, that, that I'm mostly based based in my uh, talk on. Um, that there was an increase in spontaneous uh, postsynaptic current, frequency, and amplitude. So basically, which is saying that the neurons are becoming more active. 
and we are gonna come back to this right now. So for synaptic plasticity, we already introduced the concept of LTP and LTD. LTP, we're reinforcing synapses, LTD, we're depressing synapses. Um, first study, um, two psilocybin uh, dosing sessions, four weeks apart, 28 participants, this is EEG study. So they're looking, they're putting the electrodes on the brain and they're looking how uh, the responses change after uh, the administration of uh, uh, psychedelics. Here they're showing that they're claiming to have uh, seen the enhancement of LTP. So we have enhancement, we have uh, facilitation of long-term potentiation. So it helps to remember. The, the other point, on the other hand, the presynaptic, uh, the, the other study showed that presynaptic 5H2A receptor are required for induction of LTD uh, in this coin, in this, in this case for the thalamocortical synapses. And here we can see that um, the pairing protocol, so the pairing protocol is what we will do for LTP, we have to stimulate the presynaptic and then postsynaptic to have, uh, to have it, uh, the coincidence detector and MDA to detect it. In the case of LTD, that would be the opposite. We would have to stimulate postsynaptic here and then presynaptic. And then, and then we'll have weakening of the synapse because they're desynchronized. So in this case, we can see that um, after the pairing protocol for LTD, if we add a DOI, if we add um, uh, the, the psychedelic substance here, we can see clear depression. When we have a knockout mice, so we, when we knock out 5H2A receptor, uh, the depression is abolished, which means that 5H2A receptor must uh, mediate uh, the, um, the effect of uh, uh, DOI in this case. Um, and the other studies, for example, show that many minute exposure of mouse uh, prefrontal cortex slices to serotonin um, agonist DOI again produces long lasting depression. Um, and here we can see the, uh, this baseline, they add, they add a psychedelic and you can see that the transmission depresses. So this is a response, the responses, each response uh, um, after stimulation of the neurons. And when we add the psychedelic, we can see that responses in prefrontal cortex uh, depressed. Um, on the other hand, if we block, uh, if we block 5H2A receptor with antagonist, this effect is abolished. Uh, the other study, actually the study that we, see, we saw before there as well, uh, receptor activation potentiates an MDA in adult prefrontal cortex uh, pyramidal neurons. So here the difference, and that's why uh, try to go back for NMD AMPA, okay? So the AMPA receptor would be the receptor that mediates all the responses, depolarization and current in the cell. NMD receptor on the other hand would mediate plasticity and calcium influx. So what we see in this study that the NMDA content increases. So we have an increase in plasticity, but at the same time we have a decrease in, uh, in current. So in AMPA receptor concentration of the synapse. Um, those results are very, uh, it, those results are contradicting. And actually I was talking even about the, them uh, with my director because what you can see here in general that there is an increase in activity. So, but here for prefrontal uh, cortex, you can see uh, the, the depression. So the, the activity depresses. Um, there is several uh, hypotheses that could, could uh, explain that, but uh, that, that I'll leave that for the discussion. And the last one, the last part for the behavior, what happens with the behavior, stimulation of 5H2A uh, receptor enhances uh, um, memory extinction. Uh, so what happens here, we can see each uh, green trace is a, is a stimulus, stimulus that uh, supposed to uh, evoke a few response for mice, few responses freezing. Here is the percentage of freezing um, after the uh, conditional stimulus. So we have the conditional stimulus here. First response, we have the same for uh, vehicle 2CB2 is a, is a classical psychedelic as well that works on the 5H2A receptor. So after the first one, we can see that there is no difference. They're the same. But after the second one, there is a, a clear difference between um, between uh, a vehicle control, so a mouse without a mouse without any uh, any specific molecules that would uh, 
change uh, its behavior and uh, 2CB2, which is the, uh, the classical, classical serotonergic uh, uh, psychedelic here, we can see that the fear response is greatly diminished. So we have maybe even around 50% of um, uh, diminished fear response, which means that the mouse learned faster, one can say the mouse forgot, one can say faster, um, the fear response uh, due or, I mean, uh, facilitated by those psychedelics. So there is, again, just to, just to summarize, the mouse gets the, the first mouse mice are trained. They have a conditional uh, sound, for example, with a shock, with a food shock. Uh, after that, they have a sound, but no food shock. So this is, the green is sound without no food shock. So they get a sound, there is no food shock. They didn't expect it, they didn't know what happened. They, they get the sound, no food shock. The, the mice with the 2CB, uh, with the psychedelic, they realize, they, if one can say realize, they learn much faster that there is no shock anymore and they don't freeze as much anymore um, due to that shock. And here it's uh, just, um, the opposite experiment control, I can say. So for the antagonist of 5H2A receptor, we can see for the antagonist, uh, there is no difference between uh, the control and uh, uh, the control and uh, the uh, test mouse. And here we, see, we can see on the other, with the other study, it's a similar result. Uh, the only difference here, we can see that actually smaller doses. So one 0 0.1 actually is a, is a normal do dose for humans, not it's not a microdosing dose. Um, those normal doses actually promote uh, fear, extinction, uh, fear extinction more than uh, higher doses. But at the end, all of them uh, have less uh, fear um, due to those conditional stimulus. Okay, so I just ran through the presentation because uh, I felt like I didn't have enough time. So uh, I'm sorry if I was too fast and uh, it was uh, not that clear, but uh, go ahead with the questions so I can clarify some things. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, great presentation still, don't worry, it was very clear. I do have some questions though, for sure. Um, so we have one question here in the chat. Uh, what's the main source of psychedelic induced BDNF increase in the brain? And are these plasticity changes reversible? It was the main source of BDNF? What's the main source of psychedelic induced BDNF increase in the brain? Um, this is a good question. I didn't uh, see, I don't have a clear answer because uh, I, I didn't, there is an increase, there's clearly an increase in the brain. So most likely it has to be mediated by 5H2A receptor. Uh, so it has to be a downstream pathway of 5H2A receptor. Um, why exactly and how? I, I wish I had an answer. I don't. If, if you find the answer, uh, just please let me know because this is a good question for uh, the, the pathway how psychedelics just begin to increase. Um, I don't have the answer for that though. Thank you. And then are the um, plasticity changes reversible? Yes. Yeah, so plasticity is uh, reversible. Uh, in general, reversible in a sense, it wouldn't, we wouldn't grow the same dendrite back. Uh, but for example, if we're talking uh, we could grow a new dendrite, for example, that in that sense, it's reversible on the, in the sense of uh, functional. So for the receptor content, uh, it's reversible as well, because that's what happens all the time. We have uh, uh, insertion of upper receptors. So we have potentiation, we have uh, in, and, uh, reinforcement of synapses, and we have a depression. So uh, basically, after the psychedelic effect is done, those uh, increases in brain plasticity usually go to normal. And that's why we actually have the homeostatic plasticity, which would regulate our brain plasticity back to the uh, to normal, one can say. Thank you. And I have a couple of questions for slide 10 specifically, actually. Um, so the first one was, uh, if you could just clarify what the abbreviations are on those graphs there. Okay. Um, which graph? I think there's the BDNF transcript levels and protein levels graphs. Just oh, like the okay. LCDMT, the, I think the bottom two. Okay, okay. So uh, what, what they did in the study, they, uh, they administered um, um, uh, classical psychedelic 
the administered LSD in that case, uh, psilocybin or LSD. And after that, they measured protein levels and transcript levels. So transcript levels, uh, okay, I'll start with protein levels. This is already a functional protein. This is a protein that, that would affect, in this case, that would affect TRK beta receptor, and then it would induce the whole pathway. So this is already a functional protein. Uh, for transcript levels, this is just the transcript of mRNA. So when we have an increase, um, in the in the uh, in the store of uh, BDNF that is not transcribed yet. So before it gets transcribed, there is a there is several molecules that the, the the mRNA molecules that are that are stored. For example, there is uh, the synapses that molecules are not sure BDNF stored in the synapses in uh, transcript levels uh, because they they're doing the whole cell. Uh, but the idea is that the transcript level is not transcribed to a protein. So those transcripts would be transcribed to a protein. So the idea here we don't have an increase in the storage of BDNF, but we have an increase in the level of BDNF itself. That, that, that's the whole idea here. That's what I wanted to. Perfect. And then so for the uh, orange and blue bar on those, could you just go over what those are showing as well? Like what is that's the vehicle, right? Or, or yeah, yeah vehicle. Vehicles? So vehicle is the there is there is no um, uh, there is no uh, psychoactive or active substance in there. Uh, the DOI is just another, uh, uh, I have to look up what, what is uh, what it stands uh, for exactly, but it's another uh, classical hallucinogenic that affects 5H2A uh, receptor. So, uh, I mean. Perfect. Thank you. And then um, based on, you know, what you're seeing here with BDNF, would you think that it would be advantageous to microdose LSD the day before first learning a new skill? Do you know if research shows that? The day before learning a new skill. Um, in general, what they did, a lot of studies, what they did, they, they had several, like a week, for example, or 28 days, that they're administering psychedelics every day. And they saw clearly an increase in uh, BDNF. But here we can see an increase in BDNF with the 20 uh, micrograms after one dose. So this is an acute, uh, this is an acute um, uh, administration. So technically, it should help uh, to uh, to memorize some information. But the, the the caveat again, caveat again, that we just saw the idea with depression. So it's not necessarily that it's going to help you memorize things. And the, the, we can see that with psychedelics, it doesn't necessarily, like when you have a trip, it doesn't really like help you sit down and try to memorize a verse, but it helps you rather generalize. And to generalize, we need the forgetting part. So we have to forget some of the details to generalize. The, this, this, the, the main idea of psychedelics, so for learning, it depends on the goals, I mean, I would say, and that the, the depends on the person, but in general, you would have a increase in PTNF after one, uh, after one administration. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Adrian, do you wanna ask a question there? Um, yeah, thanks for your interesting talk, Arseni. Um, I was just wondering, because this is mostly based on animal research, are you going to uh, do some research in animals as well? Or are you looking at uh, human research as well? And if you would do research in humans, uh, what methods would be the best to, um, to measure neuroplasticity in your opinion? Ooh, uh, <laughs> okay, so I, I mean, I wish uh, right now I'm finishing. I hope maybe I'll be able to uh, do an experiment or, or two. I'm hoping because um, like I'm doing the patch clamp. So I'm doing the, the figures you see here, this, uh, the depression. I'm really curious because there is not, there is two articles that I found. Maybe like there is three articles about uh, actual recordings of neuroplasticity. And it's not clear uh, does it induce depression? Why, why, how, and like this part is, uh, seems pretty contradictory right now. So I would be interested to do like one or two experiments just to confirm the results. That's for my experiments uh, in mice. I work in mice. Um, for humans though, um, I mean, if I went to PhD and did, did humans, I mean, most humans in neuroplasticity, uh, I mean, one of the studies that I was uh, showing was EEG. Uh, but I feel like it, it would be um, it wouldn't be as reliable to actually talk about neuroplasticity with EEG because the signal to noise ratio is too big there. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to talk too much about the clinical and I wanted to get into clinical trials but I, I didn't have enough time. 
So, I mean, I, I don't really have a method that like I would uh, prefer to, I mean, honestly, MRI, CEG, this is, uh, this is what people use usually. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and then just one last question um, to wrap it up is just in terms of, you know, your own research and where you want to go with this next. Um, what are your kind of future directions that you're hoping to pursue? I know you talked about it a little bit, but um, yeah, just to wrap it up. Okay, okay. No, no, that's great. Honestly, I would get, I would want to get a little bit more into uh, human research and uh, human research with psychedelics. Uh, more of um, uh, I didn't present this information here, so like I just mentioned it, for example, for default mode network. So I'm interested in how uh, the default mode network works, how, for example, psychedelics can uh, inhibit default mode networks and some other, uh, for example, uh, meditation, for example, was shown to inhibit default mode networks and how the networks in the brain work. So my future, like this, how that's what I would like to pursue is uh, mostly um, the uh, EGMRI of network uh, level um, neuroscience and then um, look how it modulates, for example, if I could get in a lab where there is a permission for psychedelic research, that's that's kind of the idea where I would, and maybe like a little bit more of uh, mental health as well. So mental illness, because there's a lot of research, in, for example, schizophrenia, and uh, I was just presenting the idea of like serotonin and the psoriasis schizophrenia and how they work. So that would be a great area of research. And right now I'm just looking and trying to see what's out there in Canada specifically. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for such a great talk and for the great answers at the discussion. I know everyone really enjoyed that. Uh, and thank you again, Adrian, as well for your talk and sticking around as well. It was great to uh, hear both of you speak today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm just going to wrap us off with a couple of uh, final announcements. So our next meeting will be next month, July 7th, uh, back at our regularly scheduled 8 p.m. time. So hopefully everyone will be able to make it and we'll see you guys then. Thank you so much for coming. Bye-bye.